MCP, also known as Model Context Protocol, is currently all the rave in tech. Now, why is MCP so important when it comes to LLMs? Now, traditionally, LLMs on their own aren't very useful unless you can interface them with your technology or some sort of interface. We've seen companies like OpenAI achieve this with ChatGPT by building a chat interface that can interact directly with the LLM. Now, this gets a little bit more challenging when you want to integrate these LLMs directly into your applications. And that's where MCP comes in to be able to help bridge the gap between your stack and an LLM. We've created our own MCP server that allows us to be able to interact with Kestra directly, which means now orchestration doesn't have to be so complicated and you can interact with your orchestrator by just natural language prompts. Let's have a look at this example and see how LLMs can make using orchestration easier. Now our Python MCP server here is gonna use fast MCP. Now I can run this locally on my machine and to speed things up, I've already installed all the dependencies using UV, so I'm ready to get started. Now, if I simply just put into my terminal uv run main.py and then dash p, I can actually put a prompt in and then specify what I want it to do. In this case, I just want it to tell me what namespaces I have in my Kestra instance. So when I run this, we'll see that it's going to make a request to OpenAI. We can see it's made a request to my Kestra instance and we can see it's then given me a number of different namespaces but I didn't have to go and you know manually make an API request to find out that information. What we were able to do is have MCP take our natural prompt, you know, in normal English, convert that into an API request to get that data. Let's have a look at a few other examples of where this is pretty neat. Here I've asked to list all the flows inside of my tutorial namespace. Now I've only got one in that namespace, which we can actually see if we go here, I've got one called hello world here, and it looks a little bit like this fairly straightforward. Now we can see here, it tells me how many revisions it's had, how what namespace it's in, the description, inputs it takes, and it describes to me the tasks it has in it as well. Let's have a little look at what's going on under the hood in the NCP server. Now we've got two files here. We've got main.py and server.py. Now main.py is where we're setting up our server. We're setting up what we want it to do. I've got a number of instructions here for chat GPT. I'm also specifying which model I want to use, which is GPT-40. And so this will then give us a good bit of context as to what we're trying to achieve so that when we make these prompts later on, it's got enough context to be able to give us a useful answer. And then after that, it's just simply uh, setting up the command line prompt and being able to return the response. Now server.py is where all the magic happens. This is we're able to take that generic prompt and then turn it into an API request. The MCP comes in lots of different shapes and sizes. This demo is just where we have implemented different routes and we're basically just using ChatGPT to help us translate that prompt into which of the API requests we should make. And then what ChatGPT can do is take the response and then use the LLM there to give us a much easier to read response rather than just like a JSON body. As you can see, if I just quickly scroll through here, we can see that we have to make a client. And then after that, we can, you know, search for flows, list flows with triggers. And we've got functions basically for each of the different parts of the Kestra API. And because Kestra has an API first design, you can actually interact with pretty much every part of Kestra, which makes this MCP server very, very powerful. But it does rely on us implementing all of this stuff as default. Some MCP servers can take it even further where they're not basically just API wrappers. So here I can list namespaces. You get the idea. I can get a lot of information. What I can do is run this as a workflow inside of Kestra, where instead of having to run manually type it into my terminal like I was doing before, where I'm running the UV run command. Instead, I can set up some inputs, make it a little bit easier for me to set up my configuration, tell it my prompt, and then also get my response in a format that's rendered in Markdown rather than just plain text in my terminal. So let's have a look at that. Here I've got a workflow that's gonna make running our Python code just that little bit easier. To make it easier, I've got a bunch of inputs here, which is gonna help the user, in this case me, know what I need to put in to be able to get a response from the MCP server. So here I've got prompt, including a default prompt, but also some instructions on what it needs, but also I can override the config. So if I want to be able to run this on a different port number or a different location, I can do that. And if I want to run this on a tenant, so if I'm using the enterprise edition, 
function, I can do that too. And then here is just simply a Python task that is going to pass in all these API keys that we've got set up as secrets or passing in the inputs. Uh, we're running it on the process task runner, so it runs really, really quickly. So it doesn't spin up a container each time we ask it a prompt. And then it's just gonna access those two Python files that I just showed you inside of the namespace file. So we've got our main.py and server.py. Now you could maybe set this up with a system flow too to automatically pull from a Git repository. But for now, I've just imported these files manually. And then just to finish up, we've got all of the installation commands to make sure we've got all of those dependencies that we need to be able to work with this. We've got output files where it's gonna generate a file for us at the end with all of that output. Useful for what we're gonna look at in a little bit later, so stay tuned for that. And then just the prompt that we were using inside of our terminal. But here I'm using an expression to take that input and put that in here. So we can change it every single time we execute this. So now when I press execute, I get given this box that asks me what I'd like it to do. I can also then click on this to override the default configuration. I don't actually need to do that. So now if I just put list all namespaces, we can see that when I press execute, it's going to run this. It's going to install all of those things on UV. And then we can see in the logs, once we get past some of these ones here, we can see that it's given us the response here are the number of namespaces inside of Kestra. So very, very useful. We can also have a look at that output file. So here, if I go to outputs, I can preview that file and you can see here that the formatting is a lot nicer. It's bolded some things, it's got bullet points, it just looks a little bit easier. So this is very, very cool. So let's ask it a few other prompts to see what we can do with it. So I'm actually gonna ask it this default one. So I have a flow called hello world in the tutorial namespace. Now this is one of our tutorial blueprints. So you can find this under blueprints if you're curious to try it out yourself. And as you can see here, it's just running a few simple tasks and it's got a trigger that's currently disabled. Now, if I go back to the MCP flow I have and execute it, we're asking it to trigger an execution of that flow using the input set to lion rather than my name, which is what it was as default and setting a label to MCP. MCP demo. So now if I execute this, what we're going to see is it's going to translate that prompt into an API request so that it can then run that workflow, which we can see here, an execution has been triggered and we can see that it's finished successfully. So now if I go to outputs and we click preview, we can see that we can actually view that execution. And here, this is just run. We can see that the timestamp matches the one on my computer. We can see that it was created a few seconds ago. So this has allowed us to set this up. We've added a label. We can also see that the input was set to Lion rather than what we have in the workflow, which is Will Russell. So it's very cool how you can just write what you need it to do and it will translate that into an API request for you. Before I show you some cooler examples, now before I show you some extra examples, I actually created an app for this. So an app will allow us to just make it even tidier to use. We don't actually need to look at the workflow. We just wanna be able to run it multiple times, especially useful for those who want to interact with Kestra to get information about it, but don't necessarily want to edit and make workflows. So here you can see I've got my app. It looks a little bit like this. It's quite straightforward. It's gonna show the inputs at the start. After that, it's going to run and not show any other logs because there's a lot of information going on there. And then it's just going to simply display that output file which we can preview in the app. So if I now click view app and run that exact same example again, we're going to press submit. It's going to take its time because we can't see the logs being produced. But then once it's finished, we'll get that output file where it's going to render the markdown. I can preview it. So here I can see here's a link to the execution. I can click on that. And now I can see that execution that again was created just a few seconds ago. So this app just tidies the whole thing up. We can see the prompt here really nicely. We can see the response here really nicely. So uh, this just tidies the whole experience up and uh, that's why apps exist. So I'm gonna show you a few extra examples using apps going forward. Now, another example I really like was being able to get all the revisions for a particular namespace and it's summarizing what happens. So when I click get all the revisions here, I'm able to, normally I'd have to go through each revision to understand what was actually changed. But this does a fantastic job of summarizing that for me so that I don't have to look myself. So let's have a look at that response. I can see that the first revision was where it was initially created, but then we changed the default user to my name and then the flow got disabled and then it got enabled and then I enabled the trigger, but then I disabled it again. So this just is a great example of where large language models can 
improve your productivity. Because while this is just making an API request, by adding the large language model on top of it, we've been able to give us a nice summary. Whereas before we would have had to have manually done that ourselves. Another one I like is being able to create a new flow. So I can actually just paste the flow straight into this box. I'm gonna change the namespace here to video. And now if I press submit, we're gonna see that a whole new workflow will get created and we'll be able to then access that directly inside of Kestra. So here we can see the workflow was created. If I click preview, we can see that it has been added to the random, we've got the ID random in the video namespace. And so now if I go to flows, we can see I now have a new workflow in the video namespace, but there's no executions for it. But don't worry, I can submit a new request to do that. So here I can say, execute my flow random in the video namespace. And if I actually go over here and refresh this, we can see that once the prompt has been made, we can see that it did in fact run it. And we can see that everything worked as expected, the fail task failed as expected. And so, uh, and I can see that here as well. I can see the tri it's been triggered. It's gonna give me a link to that execution. You can keep asking it prompts and build on what you're working with. Now in this next example, if I head over to namespaces and look at the dependencies of the company namespace, you can see there's a lot going on here. So let's see if I can get our workflow to summarize what's going on here. So here I've asked to list all the dependencies for the company namespace. Now if I press preview, we can see that it's given us this lovely diagram to show us which ones are dependent on each other. So you can see the full graph, very, very cool. And uh, you can download this as well if you want to be able to access the file somewhere else or just preview it inside of the execution. We can also ask for all the flow dependencies for flow three, which was inside of that big mess. We can see here that flow three has a bunch of flows that will trigger it. So now if I press submit, we can see the result. So here we can see that the three A, three B and three C will all trigger flow three, which is very, very cool. And we can see why they will get triggered. We can see that uh, it's subflow versus rather than a flow trigger. So uh, I just love how interactive this is. It just makes using an orchestrator a lot more exciting uh, where you can just ask it things you're thinking or things you'd like it to summarize and you get these responses in a nice easy way rather than having to figure out where they are inside of the platform. Now there are loads of things this can do. As you can see here, we can list resources. We can do things with flows and flow source code, such as creating flows or finding out information about them. We can also see information about executions of those flows. We can see uh, triggers. We can uh, activate triggers, disable them, which ones have triggers, all that kind of stuff. We can also now do backfills, which is pretty cool. I'll show you an example of that in a second. You can also do concurrency. So if you want to be able to have multiple flows running, pause, uh, resume, all that good stuff. And you can also resume with new inputs too, which is very cool. Let's have a look at backfills. So first of all, I'm gonna create a flow called scheduled flow. When I press submit, this should create our flow. Then we can run some backfills on it because we do need a flow to contain a scheduled trigger. So here we can see the flow has been created. Now let me submit a new request here to run backfills on it for the last three hours. So now what we can do is see this is gonna execute. And then when we jump in, we should hopefully see a number of executions inside of that flow. Cool, so I can now preview here. We can see that it's now done backfills. We can see when the next execution is, what the backfill period was. Again, I love the summary it provides. It just makes it a little bit easier to use. So now if I pop back to Kestra for a second and we find our scheduled flow, so we can find that here. If I go to executions, we can see that we've had a bunch of different backfills run here and we can see the different times they ran over the last three hours. So hopefully that gives you a good insight into MCP and how you can interact with Kestra in a more natural way. I can't wait to see what orchestration does with the use of LLMs to make it easier to both automate things, but also understand what's happening when we orchestrate and automate things. If you'd love to see more videos on MCP, maybe more specific examples of our MCP server in Kestra, then let us know in the comments below.